And uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers this evening. So Terry Tempest Williams is the award-winning author of Erosion, The Hour of Land, Refuge, Finding Beauty in a Broken World, and When Women Were Birds, among other books. A member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, she is currently the writer in residence at Harvard Divinity School. She's also a dear friend of Point Reyes Books, and as some of you may know, was part of welcoming us as the new owners of the bookstore at a very special event in 2016, which is a moment that we'll always remember. So we're always happy to have her back with us. And Fazl Sheikh is an artist who uses photographs to document people living in displaced and marginalized communities around the world. He is the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, which include being honored as a MacArthur Foundation Fellow and a Guggenheim Fellow. Each of his projects is collected and published and is exhibited internationally in galleries and museums. And we're thrilled to have the chance to hear one such publication discussed tonight, in addition to what I'm sure will be a wide ranging and lovely conversation. So I will turn it over to Terry and Fazel. Thank you, Molly. We are so honored to be here. This is our first reading. Uh, so we feel particularly honored to be here. And we're just going to begin. July 4th, 2020. Dearest Fuzzle, thank you for the exquisite unexpected gift of 30 moons that has traveled across the distances from Switzerland to America, from Zurich to Castle Valley. It took me several days to find the clarity of mind to open the mysterious slip made case from I'm going to start over because I'm nervous. July 4th, 2020. Dearest Fuzzle, thank you for the exquisite unexpected gift of 30 moons that has traveled across the distances from Switzerland to America, from Zurich to Castle Valley, Utah. It took me several days to find the clarity of mind to open the mysterious slipcase made from a photograph, a shroud, a scrim, a veil, I held it in my hands like a family album, yours, not knowing what I would find inside. Through the gaze cloth cover, I detect framed pictures, snapshots placed on shelves with all manner of hidden objects. I see a bejeweled mask with eyes watching me like your eyes unblinking. The embroidered flowers on the delicate draped fabric create a deceptive foreground, a tease that the contents inside will be a soft unfolding, but I know better. Having spent the last three years with you in collaboration, an artist and a writer traveling and attempting to translate the arresting landscape of Bears Ears National Monument with the community of native people who surrounded Bears Ears and live in this dry erosional beauty. I turn the slipcase over and find the seam exactly where these Thin curtains open or close, depending on one's in intent. Clues are now offered. I have no choice but to enter in. And as I do, I'm met by a girl with her eyes wide open. She is looking past me, past you, to a place of light that is shining through her. If the future is holding her gaze, may it be gentle and kind. But given what we are now in a global pandemic, in the throes of the climate crisis, I know this is magical thinking. Children such as this beautiful brown girl wearing a carefully constructed sweater with a striped hood framing her face deserve a cloak of hope. One shiny silver button that keeps her sweater closed tells me she has a mother or father who cares, as we had, dear Fuzzle. Her mouth turns downward, her upper lip dark, with a line of light shining on what is known as the angel's bow. Two small circles appear on her lower lip like drops of dew. Her nose is round, tending upward. A tiny tuft of black hair peeks out from the hood, but the focus of her eyes will not be detoured. There is a story here, an illuminated moment that you were there to witness. Is this what childhood is? A series of moments when the world lights up and invites you in? Or is it the time when we learn how to look adults in the eye before they can hurt us? A reminder to us now 
that we too were once a child born into this world as an innocent. Just now, a says Phoebe is perched on the back of the chair on the porch. Our eyes meet. It flies to the next chair, closest to me. Our eyes meet again. And it flies toward me, fluttering in midair for a closer look and returns to the same chair. I continue to write as it stares. It has not yet learned to fear me or our kind. It flies again. The wee little bird is now hiding in the willows. Oh my, the Phoebe is standing now on my head as I write to you. I must be still. The Phoebe is hovering above me. She flies and is standing on the edge of the roof watching. I believe this child was looking at a bird. She is watching the bird now as her eyes look up from the photograph next to me. Love, Terry. Lovely. I think uh, we, we imagine that um, to, to immerse the visitors, viewers in one of the passages right at the outset might be a proper introduction and to to give a sense of how the project was born um, rather than reading the introduction i just thought we would range through you know how our collaboration turned into this this project um by way of a bit of background i, I first met terry in i think it was 2016 and it's actually hard to believe that you and i have not uh, sat in the same room with one another for nearly two years now but it feels almost like yesterday that we were we were together we've spent so much time in correspondence mm -hmm. and i was at dartmouth and you and i was giving a lecture and in the wake of that lecture we had the chance to dine together a couple of times and i i told you of my stay in the southwest uh, soon after i graduated from college um and you during the course of one of our our meetings said well would you be interested in coming back to Utah to visit? Um, in particular, would I be interested in considering um, a kind of collaboration as relates to the Bears Ears National Monument? Um, it was an area I knew you know, from early in life and was very fond of, though I must say I was loath to make that visit so quickly. Um, agreed that I would, I would go quite soon thereafter and um, after spending a couple of days with you and Brooke at home in Castle Valley we traveled down to, to Bluff together and uh, we spent the day invited by the elders of Utah Dine Bikeya, which was the the five uh, tribe intertribal coalition um, Utah Ute, Ute Mountain, Navajo, Hopi and uh, Pueblo and Oh, got the mazine in the background here. So. Um, and I think what was so very touching about that day with the elders was that you had members of different communities, all of whom had put their historical differences aside in the service of one goal, the protection of this sacred landscape. Very kindly, they invited me to um, visit as, as uh, artist in residence for a time. And we started a collaborative process. Um, the elders, the members of Utah Dina Bikea, Terry, and myself. And I was particularly interested in an admonition about what might happen if the status of the monument were removed. Um, I was curious about the perimeter of the monument and in particular about the threat of extractive industry. This was oil and gas, uranium, coal. These were the kinds of things I'd been looking at in, uh, in the Negev. In any case, I won't spend too much time on that. We worked together for about three years, I'd say, Terry. Um, and in March of, of last year, or 2020, yes, we were we were to, to travel together to one of the um, oil and gas sites in Southern California. And it was exactly during this month that the pandemic uh, took hold. 
and Terry very very kindly you know researched with people at, at Harvard um, what would it be if we were to still travel during that phase it was early on in the pandemic and it all seemed so implausible what might take place uh, as an aside in the months that followed basically everything they said uh, came to fruition in the end we we were advised even by our universities not to travel and i remained at home in, in zurich switzerland and Terra was in was in, um, in castle valley and i remember terry you'll you'll correct me if i'm wrong but i sort of remember a conversation in which you said, you know, how may we continue our co collaboration in this intervening moment? Sorry, Bat just flew into the room. <laughs> That's a good omen, by the way. Um, uh, it's not, that was not choreographed. <laughs> so <laughs> we've got the Mazine and the Bat in the room. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's another collaboration. <laughs> Stage left. Uh, story of our friendship. I just have to say, we've and, got and, dogs running relays up on the ceiling. And I must say, I at, at that time I was thinking more of what our friend Jonah Yellowman had told us that this was a time to go deeper. And I was more introspective. I was very quiet and insular, and. Some moment, you know, some, I guess, days or weeks later, Terry and I correspond frequently. Um, I thought, oh, immersion in process is the thing that is providing a degree of solace through this phase of, of, of our lives. And so I thought, oh, what might be a nice thing would be to gather together a parcel for Terry. I spent the course of a month looking through 30 years of work and selected one image for every day, essentially one image to represent a day during a full cycle of a month. And I sent this package off to Terry. I would say, Terry, what I've rarely told you is that I knew when I sent you that package, I thought it was more of a, just a gift of my love for you and Brooke than it was an expectation of you doing something with it had afforded me the chance to be uh, introspective and you know contemplative and thinking about what we had seen together. But in my work, uh, I'm a person of mixed heritage. Much of my work in the world has been about an attempt to either navigate my own heritage, uh, multicultural background, or to reach across the distance of religion, of color, of, of even gender. And so the charge, I think, to you was a very, you know, it could be a very difficult thing to confront that breadth of work. Um, and, you know, a, a, a cycle of a moon later, <clears throat> excuse me, in a bit, a package arrived at my doorstep, again, unannounced. And it was from you. And I remember you know, I too have that tradition of letting a package sit and sort of acclimatize. I, I sat then for a few days and at the weekend I opened the parcel and I read the letters aloud, one after the other uh, to my partner Alexander. I read her for two and a half, three hours, these pieces. So moving, so instructive for me about images that I had known for years and yet infusing them with such a, a new energy in life and also all of the latent emotion and concern and anger that had been simmering for all of us during the course of the pandemic. And um, I'd love to hear you know, your, your impression of how it started, but just to say at the last, I think we were both loath initially to think that it was a public offering. And um, I mean, maybe you say something that, because I, I know how unsettling that must have been as an idea for you, but maybe you take the, I've spoken for quite a while, so maybe you give a little bit your sense of the origins. Thank you, Fazal. You know, I, I have to say to those of you who are here with us and 
Point Reyes Brooks, um, we've not talked about this publicly. And so if it's rough around the edges um, or awkward, you'll know why. As Frezzle said, we met at Dartmouth. I might have a different version of the story. Um, but what I saw in Frezzle's work, and I was so moved by it, how he knew each person he photographed by name, that there was a story around each encounter, that this wasn't just a gaze of, of a photographer, of someone in Rwanda, um, but actually was part of that family's experience and had spent time and, and knew the families and had broken bread with them. And it moved me so much. And these were conflict zones all over the world. And as you know, if you've read my work, my work is very local. And when Fuzzle and I had, I was so intimidated by his work, I didn't go to a dinner invitation. I just wanted to sit with them, but we had coffee later. And my recollection Fuzzle is, you know, you were thinking about what your next project was and it was always global. And you had mentioned how much you love the Southwest. And I just said, why don't you come home? Meaning America, that we are a conflict zone and we need you. And I had been working with the tribes for many, many years, decades really. And in the last 10 years with Bears Ears. And I just knew that Fuzzle and the elders in particular would have so much to share with one another. And that was true. I also remember you saying, you know, not being so enthused in my mind. And then you called about two months later and said, hello. Um, and I think I even remember you saying something like, damn you. And I thought it was our neighbor, um, but you just said, can I come? And, and you came and everything changed. Um, the elders immediately saw his soul and trusted those of us who knew Fuzzle and, and in many ways he's never left. He's in their hearts and, and they are in theirs. And so it was such a modeling of, of shared humanity. What I can tell you is when I received the gifts and it wasn't just this one image or one book of 30 photographs for 30 moons, but there were two other books and they were sandstone, they were textural, they were the Colorado Plateau that looked like skin. You couldn't quite tell what the scale was. Was it a micro view or was it a view from very far away? And I was so touched by these that I wept. I, I just felt they were the most intimate, sensual, beautiful, true surfaces I'd ever seen with such depth. they were immediately recognizable to me. Stone, earth, skin, body, body, earth, no separation. When I opened the 30 moons, which was in the middle of the racial injustices, the uh, George Floyd, um, the streets on fire. And when I looked at these, all of them black and brown bodies, I knew that I was not able, capable of entering into those photographs. And it was haunting to me. And I, in those, in that gift with from Fuzzle, I think that in many ways, if I'm honest, I confronted my own white supremacy background as a white privileged Mormon woman. And it was painful and I didn't respond in the way that I wanted to, in the way, in the name of reciprocity. And it was after that on the first full moon, July 4th, that I made a commitment that with my mother's looking glass, magnifying glass, that I would spend one day with each photograph and then write Fuzzle a letter. And in that process, I think I confronted my own racism, my own projections, my own loves, my, you know, it was just a, a deeply, deeply personal exploration of what we were all experiencing in what we thought was a pause that is now a place with the pandemic. And I sent them, I re-photographed the images on, on a textile and sent them back to Fuzzle. I had no intention of these letters ever being published. 
Um, otherwise, I never would have written what I've written. But Fuzzle is a very stubborn, persuasive human being. And um, I trusted him after a lot of, lot of tense conversations. And what I, what I realized was, you know, if I can't share them, then who am I as a writer? Because this is really what I think and feel and believe. Um, unedited, not performative, not polished. They were to a man that I dearly love as a fellow collaborator. So that's the background. And we wanted to share that with you because I think it is raw and it is how we take care of one another. And so it's a quiet offering to, to you. Puzzle, do you want to read the next piece? That's the one from Brenda. Would you like me to read that? Yeah, I'd love it. <clears throat> 11th July, 2020. Dearest Fuzzle, we're not so different, humans and birds, pigeons and people. When I see this flock of believers in the Bhajan Ashram in Vrindavan, India, I see migratory wings of devotion, the instinctive pull to return and gather among one's own kind. But then, because I know you, Fuzzle, I must seek facts and nuances. What I thought were wings are now partial shrouds spun from the filaments of the dead. What I discover is that these pilgrims are women. Their exodus for, from home is not of their own choosing. Their husbands have died. Banished by their families for the shame of being a widow, they leave their community wearing garments of grief with little or no possessions save their breaking hearts. Sometimes I don't know what to know. I, I don't want to know the story, Fuzzle. Sometimes I just want to make up my own story, create my own narrative, like I do when I'm reading a newspaper in a foreign country in an unknown language. I don't have to face the pain of the world, in particular, the pain of women. When the hurt becomes intolerable, we can resort to speaking in tongues. But you didn't just give me 30 photographs. You've placed in my hands across a great distance during a global pandemic, a photographic map of your travels around the world. I discovered if I turn over the image and read your delicate script on the back of the photograph, written with a thin black pen, then you make me accountable. And because of our collaborations, I understand what captions mean to you, context, story, injustices. What I saw as birds, I see as grieving women, mourning the lives and losses of their husbands together. Each woman cast out as a widow has found her humble way through an arduous, arduous path to the holy city of Krishna. Belief in the God she loves is replacing the body of the man she loved. Can a woman ever forget the man and the children that came through them? Can devotion of any kind, religious or secular, cancel a life lived before a new found fidelity? even a fidelity toward the self. And I wonder how poverty directs and informs the lives of these widows who are now alone in the world at the mercy of the begging bowls they hold in their worn and worn hands. Their prayers and songs uttered on the streets are rewarded with scant offerings of food and coins. And where does the single woman go upon receiving the news that the ashram cannot accommodate her. Perhaps this is the road to sainthood. Perhaps this is the path to insanity. Maybe there's no difference. Despair marries devotion in order to survive. What every mother knows 
in the daily dissolution of her life, given away to those she loves. Widow is an ugly word. You made this single word a plural beauty. Love, Terry. July 23rd, 2020. Dearest Fuzzle, I've always felt this picture you made of a boy in Pakistan with a self-portrait. I can imagine this is you in place, had your grandfather never left and your father not been born in Kenya and fallen in love with your mother in America. In fact, when I first saw this portrait without even knowing you, as I understand you now, I believe this to be you and that you may have recognized yourself in this young man and he in you, that something may have passed between the viewer and the viewed. Octavia E. Butler writes in Parable of the Sower, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. In all our conversations, both written and spoken, I don't think we've ever discussed God not even mentioned the word. And yet, I believe we hold similar ideas as to what God, quote unquote, is, can be, or not be. But when I look at this photograph and see you in your own image, the unflinching eyes directly engaged, I feel as though I am touching the ineffable, seeing yourself in another and making beauty. With love, Terry. You know, maybe we could just read the next two short ones and then open it up for questions. Okay. And I can read the first short one and, and you can follow. Okay. July 30th, 2020, dearest Fuzzle, the veil between the dead and the living is thin and porous and daily. This is what I know, truly, Terry. Can read uh, the second to last one and then the last one. Uh, 2nd August 2020. Dearest Fuzzle, hands, eight hands of women holding, comforting, supporting, working, tending. One hand remains still by her side, resting, waiting to cradle two hands soon to come. I will add two more hands, my own hands writing as these women's hands touch mine. A woman's hands, palms facing earth, understands how water witching works, sensing the unseen, bringing forth the flood, ending drought. Arms around you, Terry. So let's open it up for questions or comments and we can continue a discussion and then we'll read a closing um, piece. Um, wow, well, thank you so much, both of you for, for sharing this with us, for welcoming us into this conversation. Um, I am seeing the request and I agree to see some more of Fazel's photos. Um, a couple of times the screen share Fazel, it was like the photo didn't quite load. Um, so the last two images that you showed, I think we only got to see momentarily. And I think we're wondering if there's mm. anything, at, it, those or anything else that you can show us with this, this time now. Fazel, we didn't see the women, the widows, and we didn't see the self-portrait yep. and nor the hands nor the veil. So the last four. Ah, it shows me that I've been able to share them. Forgive me. Do you see it now? We see the woman with Ramadan, the last. We do. The problem seems to be going happening when you go from the preview. We can see all of the kind of toolbar around the photo, but then now we see just black. 
No, this is the full screen from your. Mm. How about that? Maybe, maybe the transition yeah. to full screen is the problem, and we're not getting quite the same gallery perspective, but we can see the image now. Yeah. Maybe you it's, could talk about them or, you know. It's a curious thing for me because um, so much of my work, uh, it's it's extraordinarily important to me the context of the you know the broader sweep of a project that i'm working on i hope you can see something now yes mm -hmm. okay so you know all of these w works were drawn from longer projects within which the context of naming and in many cases text to elaborate what the images uh, only allude to in some cases has always been essential to me and I think that it's a real, you know, it's a real act of trust um, for those people to give me their images. But then uh, following on that, to, to entrust those images to another, you know, that for me causes at once great concern and great promise. You know, such was my trust in Terry and our friendship and all that I've known of what she has offered the literary world and the world at large, that for me, it was a learning experience, um, encountering the images anew through her eyes. And it's not something that I would um, have really considered early on um, because of this sort of trepidation over over trespass and over a kind of protective spirit of the things that I have seen or the people that I have encountered. And yet, um, when there is that sort of basic platform of integrity, then you can take an image away from it and perhaps allow it a different life, you know, and that I think not so much for my images only, but for images in general for the image maker, you're immediately transported to the moment of having made that image, whether it's last week or a decade ago. Every one of these images, when I see them, I'm, I'm transported back to the smell or the encounter or the words of the person who sat before me. And letting that go or letting someone profoundly into that space is uh, for me also a, a real investment in in true collaboration. So, um, just to say, you know, just to say that also is how much I trust our friendship. You know, um, this is one of the very earliest images, and in general, when they would be reproduced, I would be sure to have the names. This is Akwat Niebol, who's pregnant at center, with Riak Warabek, her sister, and the pregnant, uh, excuse me, the daughter, uh, Athok Doom, who's recovering from malaria. For me, context is extremely, extremely important. Um, albeit in this, in this book, we, we allow the image to stand on its own. And for it to be encountered by Terry's writing. And then at the very last in the book is a kind of um, reference to, to the person and where the image was made. Um, this last one, if you, you can see the image, I presume, I hope. This last one is the epilogue for the piece. It's from a book called Ramadan Moon. It's an image of Zena Bazir Wadere. And Terry writes, on the streets of Amsterdam, it is Ramadan. A woman closes her eyes and says prayers. Everything she has lost, everything she has given up, everything she still hopes for is a petition before God. And in the stillness of the night, another woman finds herself upside down and what was once sky becomes a blurred body of water in love. You know, Fuzzle, I'm wondering um, if you would read the, the letter 
and your stunning photograph when you were in Cleveland of the man who turned his back with, with the hood. So as the screen sharing has been such a debacle, apparently, um, I would like to say, preface that piece with a sense of, like, you and I talked a lot, you know, we raged a lot over our correspondence about what was happening in the world. What can we do? You know, we felt like the artistic project process was, had been muted or, or stunted. And why were we investing in this? You know, it serves no purpose. And I think we, the mood came to the sense, you know, what is, what are artists supposed to be doing, but confronting substantive issues of our time. And I think that's what we, I, I don't like to put words in your mouth, but that's, I feel like what we were on about. It was a, an attempt, not only at a collaborative process between two people who have respect for one another, also saying that, you know, as singular egocentric artists, we need to reach out to others, to share our abilities with others. And the preface to this image, and then I'll read that last text here. Um, I went, I was invited to do a, a, a piece in Cleveland, and it was, you know, early on in the, in the pandemic or just before. And I must admit that I was, I was very, I was exhausted at the time I'd finished teaching and I, I felt it as an obligation. But I worked um, with refugee communities and in particular, uh, some wonderful organizations. They happened to be Christian organizations, but there was no dogma about the way in which they handled the people who visited those spaces. And I also visited these, these centers, these um, for-profit centers ICE centers in Ohio, which were receiving hundreds of migrants who had been caught at the southern border. They were transported immediately to these sequestered areas. Why? The lawyers tell me so that their community could not access them, so that they would be re beyond the reach of lawyers and they could be detained for an indefinite amount of time and then summarily deported. With this kind of thing in mind, I took some of the testimonies in the center and several of which were about, you know, real, real terror in the place that the people had come from. And I would, during the course of the day, I was meeting from people from Somalia, from Rwanda, from Colombia, and they all had really harrowing stories. How do you absorb that as an individual, process it, but also offer it respectfully. And the piece now that, that you've asked me to read is one in which I think, if I may say, you you know, you know speak to so many of the, the terrors that are um, an essential component of our times. Um, let me just read that last one for you since you've asked. My apologies that it doesn't seem to represent well. Um, 25th July, 2020. Dearest Fuzzle, you tell me this man, whose name I will keep to myself, changed his clothes for this portrait to protect his privacy for fear of refoulement. Refoulement is a disembodied word. Excuse me, I'm just going to share screen. Refoulement is a disembodied word. I say it out loud. What is another word for refoulement? Expulsion, deportation, banishment, exile, eviction, displacement, exclusion, extradition. The list of synonyms can be extended. Purging, handover, ejection, extrusion, excommunication, ostracism relegation, proscription. The action of depriving someone, anyone, from relief and safety due to a life-threatening situation is an act of cruelty by a solipsistic society. Translation, go home, you're not like me. You're not one of us. You do not belong here. You are not wanted. Go back to where you came from. 
When I look at this photograph, I have double vision. With one eye, I see a back turned on the needs of others. With the other eye, I see a back turned so as not to be seen at all. These are two different individuals wearing the same black windbreaker for protection. Both individuals are dressed in fear. Fear of feeling the pain of another, a different kind of exclusion or proscription, fear of being condemned, removed, returned to a place where you will die. The simultaneous perception of two images usually overlapping of a single scene or object is the definition of double vision. Maybe this is also a definition of empathy. He unzipped his hooded top and took it off and wished emotions were like clothes. They could remove them, fold them, set them somewhere, writes the poet Nick Laird. If only it was that easy. If only we could shed what rarely leaves us, the gnawing feelings of insecurity. If only those delivering the body blows and assault of deportation, the rupture and separation of families, the cold hearted refusal to acknowledge one's humanity. If these deliverers of displacement could want for one minute feel the anguish of that kind of physical and psychic pain, perhaps these cruelties would stop. I wonder what this man was thinking on March 27th, 2019 in Cleveland, Ohio, with his back facing you. I wonder if he is in America now. Is he alive? George Floyd is dead. Ahmaud Arbery is dead. Rayshard Brooks is dead. Black men and women and children are shot every day. They are dead. Protesters are alive on the streets as Trump's private army is throwing smoke bombs to obscure what we are seeing, believing, feeling, fearing. Democracy is under fire. Systemic racism is real. Police brutality is real. The fact is, American citizens are shooting American citizens. Breonna Taylor's ghost is haunting for justice. I have a gun next to my bed to defend my dreams. Yours in the questions, Terry. You know, Fuzzle, maybe we could um, close. And I just have to tell you that picture just undoes me still. Maybe that one more than any of the others in, in the 30 moons and 30 photographs that you sent. Um, because I remember when you sent it to me, you know, through text. It haunted me then, and I think it even it haunts me even more now. So thank you. This is July 15th, 2020. And if you can see this, um, this is an image of Fuzzles from Venares. Is that right? Yes. And these are the cremation fields? Correct, correct. Is there anything else you want us to know about these? before I read. Um, that piece actually was a kind of a gesture to um, my parents and my grandparents uh, and their loss. I made a, a book called Ether, and it's a kind of a liminal, liminal um, traversing of the, of the village, the town, uh, night walking. Every night from, from about midnight till dawn, I would walk through the sort of uh, somber, quiet alleyways of the town. And it was basically just a kind of visual poem to those, those that I have lost. It reached me that way, I must say. And to those of us who are with us tonight, um, this is the only image that renders color. And with Fuzzle, nothing is an accident. So I, I noted that it, it, it proclaimed itself in a, again, quiet, subtle way. July 15th, 2020, dearest Fuzzle, the cremation fields in Benares, India, reach me in color 
as you intended. It is elemental, sensory, like the swirling of smoke, a suffocating limerence. I smell fire consuming flesh. My hands are holding the heat. If I close my eyes, I can still hear and listen to the flames licking the last remains of my own brother's body, burning, not on a pyre, but in a retort. We are earth. We are fire. We are water. We are air. No more. We always want more. That is all. We are sparks of breakaway light dissolving. My love. Ten. Mm-hmm. So it means so much to us, to those of you who joined us tonight, and to Molly and Stephen, and all those who support this beautiful, wondrous bookstore that continues in such a communal way, um, Point Ray's books. And so I just want you to know what a privilege it is, this friendship ongoing, and the correspondence that continues, and the power of your images that actually transcend words. And I think all of us can honor the depth and sacred nature of your images that speak to relationships. I would say that the privilege is ours, all of us who are able to be here this evening today <laughs> at this this time since we're all in different time zones um to get to experience this dialogue and this conversation and that you two have continued it and opened it up in this way um especially when it shows there's you know i think we can feel the vulnerability in the conversation and sort of the tenderness of the discussion and it just we feel so lucky to be able to be part of it. So thank you both. It's also just so beautiful that we have watched Daybreak behind Fossil. <laughs> I, I don't know if anyone's <laughs> noticing that, but um, he's in East Africa where he started when it was 5.30 in the morning, five in the morning. And the appearance of the birds, I almost don't want to comment on the moment when the birds showed up because it was so beautiful. It was too perfect as if they had been summoned by the words you were about to read, but I also kind of can't let it go without saying the birds <laughs> arrived. And now it's daytime behind you. Um, it was so special. Thank, Thank you. you, Molly. And Fuzzle, bless you. I love those bats and the light and this. It's just, you know, what you were saying, Molly, about, um, I think we all love Zoom because it brings out any sense of perfection or performance. It's just, this is where we are. Darkness yeah. turns to light, bats fly through, birds appear. You know, that's the magic of life. So. And the, the wonderful thing is that if we ever do this again, I will be at 6 o'clock here and you will all be at 4 a.m. there. That's, that's why I accepted. I thought, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> 6 p.m. Eastern Eastern Standard Time, Eastern African Standard Time. Oh no, that's not. <laughs> hey, we're game, you know. <laughs> so anyway, love to everyone, and um, as we approach this season of lights, um, may we hope for exactly that. Terry, I can't tell you all you bring to this world, my sweet woman. I'm so lucky to know you. I feel like uh, I feel like I've known you forever. My and face is red. What, um, what I would like to say is, you know, I, I listened to you, your piece on grief the other night. And I have to say, I think I've only said this to you once or twice, but I was, we have mutual friends, a very dear friend of my mentor, uh, Emmett Gowan, uh, with whom you've worked before and who's a close friend of yours. In any case, you know, when, when I finished in college, I had a loss uh, of family members, and I was the first thing that really deeply touched me was reading Refuge. And not only was I reading it, but then I was in the Southwest, you know, I was in the neighborhood of your home. And such is the kind of strange serendipity of life that 
you know, all these years later, uh, we have become the dearest of friends. And, and you, you are, you know, brave and strong in ways that I am really sh shocked by often, uh, unpredictably so. And I have to say, I, I'm, I'll say that publicly for the, for the community, you know, and I hope that's not uh, in front. Terry was really, really reluctant with these letters because they are so raw and so honest and so deeply poignant and revelatory about our lives, about her life. Um, and I think, I hope, I don't know, we'll, we'll have to see how, how that feels after a time. But um, I felt immediately on reading them aloud that weekend uh, that it was exactly that kind of fragility and honesty and vulnerability in general of somebody of her ilk, or even, even mine, but more, maybe more profoundly of hers, that is exactly what people needed to, to hold on to now. It's not like, oh, you know, these other people must be doing, you know, wonderfully. Why am I in my home alone feeling, you know, devastated by the world? I think we all move through that in anger and fear and isolation and depression. And I think that this book, and I, and I don't mean to say my participation, I mean, I mean those words. I think that those words are offering, uh, it's not a favorite word of Terry's, but they're offering solace or they're offering comfort in a very profound way. And they're also really precise when they need to be in a kind of to hell with what politics is in the world right now. And so I, I thank you for, for you, know, ex, you know, ultimately saying let's, trusting our friendship and let's, you know, let's try and see how it goes. Anyway, I just felt like I wanted to say that. So thank you for extending yourself. I just, you know, I think it's, we've got to have these conversations and we're not, we're not having them in the academy. We're not having them in our homes. We're not having it in, in our families. You know, I can tell you in our household, we didn't have them around the Thanksgiving dinner. You know, so I think um, I think that's where the arts can help us um, to go into those deeper spaces that Jonah asked us to do. And I think for both of us, um, when Jonah said we have to go deeper, um, we took him at his word. And, and that's not a risk, that's an imperative. Mm -hmm. so, good night. Thank you. Good, good morning. You. It's a pleasure to meet you. And thank you. Good morning. morning. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Got to go tend my bats now. Okay, bye. <laughs> How do you get out of this thing? <laughs> you're here. So you're trapped forever now. Here oh, well, you, you know, you find your way out. <laughs> I'll end it. Oh, okay.